Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Event Industry News Podcast. My name is James Dixon, and as always, wish you a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever and wherever you join today's podcast from. And joining me at the piano today, and that's for anybody who uh, who does follow me on Twitter, um, uh, you, you, you'll know uh, recently that I've taken to setting up the podcast studio on top of the piano at home, which has proved to be a, a, an excellent piece of equipment for recording these podcasts. Um, joining me at the piano today is somebody that uh, I first met at uh, Event Tech Live USA Canada just a few months ago. One of the gentlemen who was speaking at that event over the three days that we broadcast, Dr. Barris One. Barris joins us today from his own particular podcast studio. Barris, it's lovely to have you on the show today. Barris is the co-founder and CEO at Precision Communities and joins the podcast for the first time. Very good morning to you. Good morning, James. Good morning. I'm joining you from the ironing board. This is fantastic. You're on the piano, I'm on the ironing board. We're all about innovation in this industry. And, and, and you know, I, I'm sure... Up. There's a lot of people laughing uh, whilst they're listening to that, but laughing because we've all done it. I can put my hand up and say that I have also done the Ironing Board uh, podcast at some point, um, as I'm sure a lot of people listening to this today have done with their own video meetings, especially in the last year or so. Um, it's great to have you here, Barris. As I said, you you were part of Event Tech Live um, just a, a couple of months ago, um, and um, you're joining us here today to talk, I suppose, in a little bit more detail about what you've been up to at Precision Communities, not just in the last few months, but, but you know, longer mm -hmm. term as well. There's been all sorts of mm -hmm. exciting things <clears throat> happening there. Before we get into some of the more recent um, developments, tell us a little bit about about yourself and your own professional background and how Precision Communities came to be. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the thing is I've been in the events for uh, more than 15 years now, uh, and uh, I have worked in uh, many of the really big players like IT, IT Becoming Hive, and Tarsus, and I've held uh, really, uh, let's say, uh, group level jobs uh, at the uh, head of marketing, uh, C-level jobs in uh, commercial, and uh, I have seen uh, the uh, interior workings of uh, a big commercial organized entity uh, as we would know it. So I have been involved in uh, mainly marketing and sales of uh, more than hundreds of shows worldwide. I've, have, I've had a very, let's say, a fortunate uh, career until about COVID data. Uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, with the uh, great changes that are happening in the industry uh, in COVID, uh, I uh, set up uh, about uh, doing uh, my own business. Uh, this was last year. And uh, so uh, we looked at uh, changing uh, our own, let's say, mindset and our uh, attack angle uh, to uh, providing events, how we would do that. Because uh, what happens in the world of events is, as we all know, uh, if you're launching an event, uh, the number one thing is that you look at people that attended other events. Yes. Because, you know, event yeah. goers are event goers, right? Mm -hmm. It could be visitors or that could be exhibitors. It doesn't matter. The number one... <clears throat> hit list is the exhibitor list of somebody else's. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's a very incest community of, uh, let's say, exhibitors and visitors, if you look at it. And uh, we've uh, had some research. Uh, we've been looking at it, and uh, we've been talking to people. And uh, we've actually found out, not found out, but, but we just came to a realization uh, that uh, because of I, I had it up sales as well at some point, uh, globally, we would sell to 10% of our leads. That, that was a very good benchmark. We'd be happy with it. So that automatically puts nine companies out there that didn't exhibit for every one company that did exhibit. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the threshold for exhibiting for a company that did, didn't choose to exhibit was super high because it was a physical exhibition always. But with COVID, what happened is, I think now there is a way in the world for the non-exhibiting companies to start experiencing what an exhibition looks like. And that we believe is virtual. So we don't set up about uh, doing virtual shows to eat away live shows, on-site shows. Interesting. But we're setting up virtual shows to actually look at a nine times bigger market of people that, that don't actually exhibit and wow. giving them more than leads because their lead generation uh, activity is just digital uh, lead activation, that's it. So we can, are in yeah. business of producing virtual shows for non-event goers 
and giving them an access to beyond leads, which is the actual process, you know, face to face. So that that was the light bulb moment that we had. That, do, do you know what? I, I can almost hear the penny dropping amongst our audience um, as they listen to you say that because it's absolutely right, isn't it? You know, the, 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 we, we know it, anybody who's ever worked in sales, regardless of what you're selling, advertising, uh, exhibition mm-hmm. space, you know, you, you, for, for however many people you contact, a percentage of those will buy and a bigger percentage won't buy. And what's the biggest mm-hmm. objection usually in the exhibition industry when you're approaching 10 companies about exhibiting is that nine of them say, we can't afford it. We, we, yeah. We're not big enough as a company to, to spend a few thousand pounds or a few thousand dollars to have a booth or have a stand at that, at that particular show. You know, we just can't afford it. And you know, it. it doesn't end there. It's just they give you a few thousand dollars. They're going to give a few thousand more to fly there. Then yeah. another few thousand to just uh, for the booth and catering, all that. So the thing is, uh, the uh, barrier to entry to a real life event is high. And with COVID, what happened is that we all went, okay, we cannot do live events anymore. So we all went into virtual. But I think the, the way to go about virtual as a replacement to face-to-face is the wrong way to go about it. So we're building virtual, fully virtual shows, mm-hmm. not even hybrid, in a, as a way to extend a, a, an older branch uh, to the non-exhibiting community as a midway point. Look, this is a virtual exhibition. It costs, a, it costs a fraction of what a real exhibition costs, but it gives you beyond leads. It puts you face-to-face in calls with people who want to buy your product. So that, that's what we're trying to, uh, let's say, uh, the world we're trying to navigate. In, in doing so, uh, there's a story behind why we are called Precision Community. Uh, and uh, we were called that a year ago. I mean, now community is a buzzword. It wasn't when we chose it. Uh, so the thing is, for for us, uh, we we know how hard it is to go and set up uh, a buyer seller type B two B event. Yeah, mm-hmm. you have to be from within that community to have the permission to build an event for that community. So by that definition, we could only do events for events. So <laughs> that sure. doesn't work. So. Uh, for us, <clears throat> what we did is uh, we, by the with knowledge of uh, there being a lot of people out there who don't exhibit, but all but they that doesn't mean that they don't have communities, yeah. Sure. So precision communities was built with the uh, like a mantra to approach communities out there, digital communities, who don't do events and do events with them. Mm. So that's why we're called precision communities. We can work with any community out there. This could be a community of, I don't know, lawyers, this could be a community of whatever, architects. Now, our first one that we're launching is a community of digital agencies worldwide. We have right. approached uh, a community uh, that uh, 4,000 strong digital agencies community that didn't do events before. And we explain our model and we're with them launching what we call our first product, community product is called agency growth events so mm-hmm. it's for it's a uh, it's like a group of shows for uh, let's say uh, virtual shows which we call a season we put it together uh, and uh, we're launching it for the growth of digital agencies we bring them together with brands with vendors and uh, we're marketing to these audiences with our community partners and by doing so we use their existing brand uh, permission their reach and uh, bringing in our knowledge of how to do events, buyer-seller relationships, and uh, the uh, technology stack that we have, and therefore creating a solution for the community to go beyond just the gen uh, online. Uh, so that's our first community partnership. And we're working on uh, getting other communities uh, online. So we're looking at a few other communities, talking to them right now, and uh, hopefully uh, more will come. And and when it comes to the um, to the to the sales process, the w- one thing that springs to mind is, I- I've I've been in positions with with some of the clients that I work with and different companies that I work with in the last twelve months where they should have been exhibiting at events at trade shows and those events mm-hmm. couldn't happen and so those trade mm-hmm. shows approached them and said we're doing a virtual exhibition. Now because that particular company had had success. <clears throat> in the face-to-face live events uh, uh, marketplace before. They were very, very uncertain about going to the virtual one. 
they actually mm -hmm. wanted to stay in the live arena because that's where they they knew that they would get business from. So actually, mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering from a sales point of view, does it make the task a little bit easier as well, perhaps approaching organizations and businesses who have never uh, experienced the live events? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, or, or have se shown se the, sector. So it's, it's building them into it. It's building mm -hmm. them into it gently, you know, ra rather than Absolutely. having to make that financial commitment. But but more so as well, that uncertainty about it, because for a small business that maybe has never done that before, it's no different to maybe buying two brand new expensive computers or a company car for the first time. It's a significant investment for their business that they've got to justify the expenditure of and make sure that there's enough business coming back in to then pay for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the uncertainty comes with exhibitions, isn't it? It's like purchasing any other significant product for a new business. Yeah, and uh, for us, actually, we're just a very small correction there. We're not calling it an exhibition. We're not mm. in the virtual exhibition space. It's mm. more of a conference, what we're doing. More of a complex yeah. type thing, yeah? Because uh, we got three audiences. We got digital agencies in the middle. They want to sell their services to brands. So brands come for free, visitors. Yes. Uh, the digital agencies are delegates. They pay a little to come in, but that's more of a, like a, a filter for us to filter out the people that don't matter. So that's <laughs> that. Then there are uh, real exhibitors that wants to sell to digital agencies and those are the technology, marketing technology vendors. So that sale to marketing technology vendors, the, that's more, that looks more like an exhibition sale, yeah? yeah? Because we say, okay, this many uh, of your key audiences are coming, come take a virtual booth. We got uh, this many people coming, so you can see them, you can talk to them, you do, uh, you, you, you uh, get business. Now for the people in the middle, uh, the fee is much smaller, pretty, pretty, uh, well, even less than one uh, European continental flight, yeah? yeah. Uh, and for that, it is a, it's not even a risk. It's just like, you can try it, yeah? Uh, you can try and see if that works. Because we're not trying to make the money from the delegates. We're trying to make the money from uh, the exhibition side, as we always have. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you put it in the conference setting with not one, not two, but three audiences, we believe that works better. And uh, we're all trying to reach people uh, who don't do live events yeah who don't Absolutely. go to live events mm -hmm. and believe me there are so many out there uh, and uh, to these guys we're trying to have a halfway let's say uh, solution uh, for best of both worlds hopefully hopefully yeah. not worst of both worlds but yeah, yeah, yeah. best of both worlds solution for them and also that will give them as you as you said earlier on an introduction to, to, to maybe some success and why then maybe further down the line they consider actually a, a, a real life in person event. What well, one thing I wanted to ask you is um a, a particular headache among event organizers for many, many years, the live event organizers, was um the the effort and the input from people participating in advance of the show. You know, and mm. and organizers have said for years the more you put in as a visitor or as a speaker, or as a, an exhibitor, who, whatever you mm -hmm. are, the more you put in, the more you're likely to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, ju I'm just curious, is, it, is, it, is that message still as important in the virtual world as it is in the real life world? Well, I'm sure it's uh, even more important than ever. But uh, <clears throat> with that in mind, we've uh, actually made another uh, layer of innovation, we'd like to think is mm -hmm. that we're not doing one show. Because doing one date, one show, and culminating, crescendoing to just one date, we believe is super risky. Uh, and more in the virtual world. Because if you're in the physical world, you commit. You buy a ticket, you come and stuff like that. But in the virtual world, you can, uh, well, we're only as good as Netflix on the next tab, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so the yes. thing is, yeah. So you have to be super competitive for somebody's time. So what we're doing is that we've actually launched from the very start. We knew that we didn't want to do one event, but we want to do an event series. Mm -hmm. So we're selling a package of four events. And uh, they, they happen one every month, starting September. So it's September, uh, October, November, December. You buy a pass from us, it gives you four events. You buy an exhibition booth from us, it gives you four events. So that we de-risk your participation with us. Uh, and if the first, if the first uh, step didn't work well, the second will. 
If the second work, great, great. Then the third is gonna be, work, work better for you. And we'll get more people. So we're trying to move away from this make or break mentality that we've always had. And yeah. to really have a, a, a more, uh, let's say, relaxed approach. And what we're also doing is that we're keeping it super short, our events, these four events. Are always half day thing, yeah? Uh, so it's like one keynote, two panels, that's it. Because people are coming, we always say we're networking first mentality. People mm. are coming to talk to each other, not to listen to people. Uh, yeah. That also, but the uh, more important slide for us is the networking slide. Mm. Uh, so what we're doing is that it's uh, the, uh, the content is interlaced with networking breaks. So there's like a keynote, then there's half an hour of networking. Then there's another uh, panel, another half an hour of networking. And that is a half day event. And we do four of those and sell all of that in one package. And with that, we can't, uh, that, sorry, uh, with uh, that, we're trying to de-risk the whole thing that in our mind is you miss it, it's gone. Of course. And the, the word that springs to mind to me is jeopardy. You know, when you have that that one day event, that there is, there is, you know, the, the, that's big, you know, significant jeopardy there because we've all seen the, the, um, the sort of disillusioned organizer at the end of his show day walking around who knows that the visitor numbers maybe haven't been as good as he wanted, who knows that the some of his clients who've exhibited there maybe haven't got the business that they 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 desired, you know, by being there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, that there is that jeopardy, you know, if you get it wrong as as a visitor, as an exhibitor, as an organizer, that one day goes and it's 12 months before that opportunity comes yes, around. We, we believe uh, we, we don't want to replicate that in the virtual world. We're not bound by it. What, why uh, do we need to? We don't need to. Well, do we? we don't need to. Well, we do need crunch points to get more attention into a certain time span. Absolutely. That's why we do it live. Uh, but we don't need to do it just on one day. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it at a specific time and uh, let's say a mental space of a few days. But that few days is happening over four months. That's what we're doing. It's interesting the terminology that you used as well, because you said I'm sure that you used the word season um, yes. earlier on, and obviously that, that that's a, 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 a term that we become used to when we're watching TV. You know, when we're watching Netflix or mm -hmm. Prime or whatever. Oh, it's yep. season one. Oh, where are you? I'm up to season two. Uh, we have yep. seasons in podcasts. So some podcasts are, mm -hmm. are the published in seasons, and it's interesting mm -hmm. that that. One of the things that came out of Event Tech Live USA Canada a couple of months ago was this idea that virtual events, what you're essentially doing is you are broadcasting. You're creating your own, you know, TV Absolutely. station. So why not refer to it in using some of the same terms that you would use in that in a, in a broadcast context? Absolutely. Uh, to be fair, we uh, took the terminology from video games, uh, not right. from uh, TV. But yeah, uh, but for, uh, I'm a gamer myself. Uh, so the thing is, uh, the season one that we're launching, uh, it, it is a term that you, absolutely right, that you know you understand what I'm trying to mean when I tell you it's a season one. Mm. Uh, then it means there will be season two, yeah? And then season three, hopefully, lots of seasons. Uh, but uh, when, what, we're, what we're building, we're trying to build is, uh, 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 we are working with Grip, uh, and uh, yeah. we're, uh, to host it and uh, with them we're uh, co-developing something we we like to call a uh, community hub because in our season one there are four five days of live content but there are actually 120 days uh, so what happens in the off live day days is that you can still log in and watch what happened and still see the other people mm -hmm. but the meetings the real face-to-face -face meetings happen on show days and they yes. don't happen on off day uh, because we know that you don't you're not going to just drop everything and just live on our platform. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but what yeah. we're trying to do is that also. I mean, there's also a belief. I I remember uh, going to uh, Ufi CEO meetings and stuff like that, and being talking on stage and telling people uh, what happens in the remaining 360 days of the year. Oh, your yeah, client goes to 10 other events. Wake up! Yeah, you don't yeah. just go to your event. So, so <laughs> the thing is. Uh, so we, we're not uh, living in an illusion that uh, our clients will just drop everything and just be log on to our platform and do all their interactions in their life on our platform. But the thing is, we're going to give them an option uh, for this platform to be different every time they log in with mm. some information, with new people, 
and uh, the preparation uh, launch pad for the actual live show that's coming up again, because there's a rhythm to our thing, yeah? Mm-hmm. So there's a, a show in every uh, every month. There's another one. There's another one. There's another one. And it's that show is not a full day show. The programming takes like two, two and a half, three hours. Mm. But it's more networking and less uh, programming. So basically, it's a we hope an easier, uh, let's say, commitment uh, time-wise uh, for uh, our clients. It's interesting, isn't it, when you say that it, it did make me chuckle about, you know, what do they do on the other 360 days? Well, they go to other shows, you know, to, to, and, and again, organizers sometimes, that, 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 you know, that, that I've seen them. Oh, what? You go, you go to other events. Sure. What? You don't just come to mine once a year and then that's it. <laughs> um, and it's like asking somebody, you know, do they only ever go and watch one band in concert or do they only ever yeah. listen to one artist yeah. when they listen to music? You know, pe- people will listen to a number of things. And if it's in a genre or a, a sector that is relevant to them, then they, they may go to mm-hmm. four, five, six different things throughout the course of the year. You know, the, well, it's, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily competition. It's good to embrace the fact that people are, are, are you know, are, are attending a number of different things and maybe to use that well, to your advantage. In, in uh, exhibitions, um, you know, as well as I do, and uh, sometimes you have clients who have more show experience than you do. Mm. Because they, they don't, that same client that you're selling to is the uh, exhibitions, let's say, team of that company you're talking to, and they exhibit in two half shows per year. You don't. Yeah. 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 So that happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you're talking to somebody who who works on the production team for Event Tech Live. Every single client that walks through the door, you know, think, <laughs> think, thinks that they know their job better, your job better than you do. Uh, that, 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 that's the reality of it, you know, that, and that's 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 the pressure that, that you put yourself under. Um, something you, you you mentioned that you're a gamer, Barris, and um, mm. that was something that was discussed in a number of different sessions at um, mm. uh, Event Tech Live USA Canada um, about the mm. whole community aspect of the gaming community and how well the mm. gaming industry has capitalized mm. on the community aspect of it. Um, in mm-hmm. terms of how it programs its actual games to embrace multiplayer mm-hmm. and people connecting from all over the world, mm-hmm. in terms of how mm-hmm. it delivers its social media strategy, in terms of how it mm-hmm. has live events, you know, pre-pandemic that that work hand in hand with those communities. Um, it, it, I must ask you, is that something that, um, that, that you've looked at as a gamer yourself? Have you looked at how the gaming industry has built its online digital communities and what your thoughts may be on how the events industry can actually learn from what the gaming industry has delivered. Well, the thing is, we I look at it every night, by the way. <laughs> I go <laughs> and play. Uh, but, but the thing is, uh, it's a very different uh, part of you as a person, yeah? Uh, it is uh, the consumer side of you uh, that the gaming industry is after, not uh, the professional side of you. Okay, uh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, for B2B events, uh, it takes an industry, industry research, six decision makers to uh, decide to sign the dotted line for an event. So basically, uh, it's uh, not the uh, same impulses that really create uh, the, the, these changes. Uh, and, uh, so these committees are uh, dramatically different, uh, I think, in their uh, fabric. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that being said, of course, uh, the, uh, the gaming industry, uh, uh, was not, but has become in the last few years, and more with the pandemic, a live industry. The gaming industry, uh, yeah. I remember, pre-internet, of course, you just play by yourself, maybe <laughs> with a few friends. With the internet, with not many people on, maybe you will play with some people that you don't see. But now, lately, you can uh, you go to war games with 150 people on them. Uh, so the thing <laughs> is, it's growing and. And uh, so the thing is, uh, it's, it's becoming a very social experiment. Therefore, uh, they uh, reach into how they brandish their content, how they release their content. Therefore, the season mentality we really took from them because we really like it, how, how they release their seasons and what happens and uh, how they get expect- set expectations and how can they set a live event on top of a gaming platform that you just, uh, put your alarm clock and make sure that you're logged in at that time. So mm. th- those things, uh, from a consumer perspective, uh, they are leading, but B2C has always led B2B anyway. So. 
Sure, absolutely. And, and the, the other thing that I see there again is the um, it, it is from a marketing perspective, um, and I don't know if the, if we can extract any ideas for the events industry here is where it, they occasionally deliberately take them offline whilst they're preparing to launch a new season, and, and it's that. Yeah. And it's it's that period of time where people can't play and can't access it. It heightens their desire to get back on. Um, yeah, and, but and, 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 and wouldn't it be great if we live, if we had a virtual event <laughs> scenario where people were that desperate to get on? You know, you take it offline for a couple of days. Say, Come on, we need to get back on yeah, it. But, but then we would need to do a B two B live uh, event for sixteen years old. If we do that, <laughs> then they'll be fine. So they got more time than anything. Yeah. So that's yeah. why the gaming industry can do things like that because they appeal to a younger, much younger, uh, let's say, uh, demographic that yeah. have nothing else to do in their life. That's their <laughs> life. Yeah, they want to be on it. So uh, it's it's not really directly comparable, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm when just clarify for me when the agency growth dot events um season is is due to run. Is that something that's in the planning stages at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's past planning. It's uh, in sales, and uh, it will be uh, live on the the sixteenth uh, of September. Is our first uh, base camp event. Uh, if you log into our uh, website, you can find all the details. Uh, and uh, from there on, we have a, a show every month until the end of the year. And in December, uh, we have uh, our crescendo, our summit, uh, and with that, uh, we'll have concluded season one, and hopefully start season two uh, very early uh, next year, and uh, build from there. So it's, it's coming. We're really on uh, the uh, final preparation uh, round for it, uh, getting up uh, all our broadcast studios live and stuff like that. So uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, uh, I do. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard work. It's hard work, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, we'll get to a good start. It is hard work, but it's it's also a learning curve, and it's a, a one that I found fascinating last year when we took Event Tech Live in November last year virtual. Mm. You know that the, the, the the new skills, um, you know, both in terms of your understanding of software platforms and also hardware as well, you know, setting up, you know, virtual studios and and, and just, you know, the, the, the learning curve that the industry's had to go through in the last 12 months has been spectacular. And I think it puts us in a good position from a, an educational point of view and a, and a training point of view and a skills perspective is that a lot of people now in the industry are so much better equipped to do so many different things because they've learned how to be multi-skilled. <laughs> they've learned how to be broadcasters and AV technicians and vision mixers and, you know, uh, online content moderators you know, we've all learned these different skills in the last 12 months. I, I personally, I think that puts us in a great position, you know, for, for all events when, when they come back. Well, the thing is, uh, events will definitely, definitely come back. Uh, but the, the challenge for a, a hybrid, I think the hardest event now is a hybrid event. Uh, mm -hmm. Easiest probably is a virtual, then the, the, the harder is a live event. But the hardest is that because you have to produce two events at once, is a hybrid uh, setting. Uh, mm -hmm. We are refraining from that. Uh, we are staying firmly on the virtual only side for the time being because we find it uh, more appealing to our audience because it's a more international, uh, let's say, element to it. Uh, but uh, you're right, in hybrid, you have to really set up some really, uh, really top notch hardware to make sure that stuff runs. In mm -hmm. here, we can sort everything out on software. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation today. We've been joined on the podcast by Dr. Barris One. Barris is the co-founder and CEO at Precision Communities and uh, talking about how, um, you know, going completely virtual. We've had a lot of hybrid event conversations on the podcast over the last 12 months or so, um, understandably. But it's been great to get your perspective today, Barris, on this idea, you know, of doing the virtual only and of utilizing, potentially tapping into that marketplace of people who don't go to live events, you know, that nine out mm -hmm. of 10 that don't go as opposed to the one in 10 that do go. Um, and it's been it's been great to find out a, a bit more about that. Um, if you want to find out about 
um, what the team over at Precision Communities does. Um, I think precision.community is their uh, is their website address. And uh, you can also hop onto LinkedIn. And if you search for Precision Communities on LinkedIn as well, there's loads of great information. And you can join their community on the LinkedIn platform. Um, Barris, thanks very much for joining the podcast today. It's been, no um, pleasure, it's been great no to see you. Uh, presumably busy in the in the next co- in, in in the coming weeks um ahead of uh, ahead of these uh, yeah agency season (laughs) well it's it's been great to be joined by you today thank you very much for uh, setting up the ironing board um in order (laughs) in 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 order to join us and uh yeah i'll put a shout out as well which i've not done in a while if you've got pictures of your own home um you know the videos set up then uh, tweet them to at event news blog we'd love to see some uh, some pictures of how you've uh, set up your own uh, video meetings and podcasts whilst um, a lot of people are still working from home and uh, not quite back in the office yet don't forget that if you are watching this uh, on eventindustrynews.com you can head over to your chosen podcast platform and you can listen to audio versions of all of our podcasts going back to 200 and nearly 50 something episodes over the last few years of course if you are listening to this today head over to eventindustrynews.com and you can check out video versions of all of our podcasts as well as all the latest news features supplements uh, and what's happening in the industry on eventindustrynews.com. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. Our thanks once again to Dr. Barris One from Precision Communities for joining us today on the podcast. It's been great to get his insight on what they're doing in the world of virtual events. And we hope to see you on the next edition of the podcast very soon. Goodbye, everybody. Mm-hmm.